Good morning, folks. Today we're starting in 304 angstroms, and while we've got space weather in the peripherals, you'll need to wake up fast for today's top stories. So as a brighter region turns in from the left, we go to spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last 24 hours on our star were relatively calm. Towards the far left coronal hole on the north, we see popping and coronal hole expansion that is real open flux development and will interact with Earth later this week. When it comes to the solar flares, we've got minor budges on the chart due to the incoming region on the south. The bright loops into the corona indicate we've got sunspots beneath. The grouping is just now becoming visible this morning, and we can see it's a tight, complex region that we'll have to watch this week as magnetism appears beta at very least. It's a nice test for the Earth-facing quiet, as you'll see the open flux development again here in 211 angstroms, and while we expect a coronal hole stream impact later today, we've already taken an impact this morning. Three days ago, we showed you the huge filament eruption and how a piece was likely heading our way. Well, it was indeed small, and it swept past Earth a few hours ago, driving only minor activity in the magnetosphere. But when the coronal hole stream arrives later today, an already activated field could make for moderate to stronger storms if the stream is robust. Eyes on that today as we head to our top stories. Years of data compilation by the Goddard SVS has allowed for the creation of ocean current sequences at the surface, and also... 2,000 meters down, with the corresponding sea level drops, you can see where those currents flow relative to the surface. They have this animation for the global scale at depth as well, but perhaps more importantly, this is the best way I've ever seen to help you visualize the point we've made over and over. The El Nino conditions are based on deep water mixing, with these currents fed to the central Pacific from the Antarctic coast. This is why warming leads to cooling, and melting leads to La Nina and terrible winter conditions, etc. We're zooming in next with Apex View of ADFS 27. And when there was a point of light that wasn't behaving normally, they pointed the vastly more powerful ALMA at the star and found it was actually two whole galaxies very, very far away, very close to one another. Beyond the fact that the better technology allowed us to see that one point of light was actually two, I thought I was seeing a reach from both galaxies towards each other with a peak plasma density in between them, so I pulled the full data image and did not allow any energetic pickup to be left out with fading and shading and darkening, etc. This is what it looks like if you consider everything the satellite picked up, and if you don't recognize this structure, it is the plasma connection between massive objects in space that we are used to seeing. This is what causes a static shock on a door handle and what NASA's Dr. Uyen showed us just a few days ago in Where Are We Going and how the energy begins connecting the objects long before they collide. And speaking of that series, it turns out that the Perseus cluster is embedded within a supernova remnant similar to our own. You will recall that our solar system will soon exit the local cloud remnant and enter the void bubble blown out by the nova, well, what they have discovered is that the iron and nickel makeup of that region almost identically matches that of our sun, which indicates a similarity that was greatly unexpected. China has significantly reduced their sulfur dioxide pollution over the last decade. Unfortunately, it appears that India is going in the other direction. Five points from Gryffindor. So hopefully you all saw this quake forecasting results chart in yesterday's video. It's from quakewatch.net. Well, I promptly got an email from a friend of mine at the USGS whose anonymity I begrudgingly honor because it's worth it. All he sent me was this, and I knew immediately it was the joule energy released by magnitude for earthquakes. Give a moment to take it in and realize that whether you're talking about joules or petajoules and you move the decimal 15 places, the basic idea is that a magnitude 8 releases about 30 magnitude 7's worth of energy, and that goes for every full point drop, which means if you miss a 7-pointer in your forecast, it would take 30 magnitude 6 events to make up that loss and just break even. So when I went through and added up the energetic release of the magnitude 6.9s and above, it became readily apparent that if we are tracking electric current events and space weather energy effects, then 68% hit rate was one way to look at it, but 81.5% of the energetic release at highest magnitude is another. The score of 275 petajoules to 62 more accurately resembles the expected statistically random accuracy, except flip-flopped. We're expected to have about 15% success and 85% failure. Folks, since my wife and I ship out all the children's books ourselves, a bit of travel here means we can only guarantee delivery by the holiday for orders the rest of November. And if you're going to come to Observing the Frontier 2018, we've been told that rooms at the venue are now 60% gone, and we only have 30 tickets left. Hope to see you and shake your hand in the desert. 
You've got the win maps followed by shots of our star to close. We greatly appreciate your support. We'll do this all again tomorrow, right here, but right now. It's 5.15 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.